Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Ostman and I'm the Communications Manager in the American Library Association's Public Programs Office. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, What Happened in Kansas City, Free Speech, Library Programs, and the Law. The incident that we're going to be talking about today took place last May at a program at the Kansas City Public Library. During the course of that event, a library patron was, was arrested for questioning a speaker. When library staff member Stephen Woolfolk tried to intervene, he was also arrested. This is a concerning incident and one that I think we can all learn from. We are very excited to have Steve here today to share his insights into what happened on that day. And we will also hear from Deborah Caldwell Stone of ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. She will put the arrest in context and talk about some of the legal issues surrounding free speech in library programs. I have a few brief announcements before we get started. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office and the Cultural Communities Fund. The Cultural Communities Fund is an endowment that supports cultural programming in libraries, and it enables us to offer free professional development opportunities like today's webinar. If you are in a position to support CCF, please visit us, visit us online to make a contribution of any size. The website is on your screen, ala.org slash ccf. Hopefully many of you have heard of Programming Librarian, which is a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. Visit us for program ideas, resources, and an online learning library full of free on-demand webinars like this one. We also send a free e-newsletter e twice per month. To sign up, just go to programminglibrarian.org and click About. Finally, a note about our online classroom. Only our presenters have microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box as we go along. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar. And if you're having any technical issues any time over the next hour, please send a private message to PPO Super Admin. To do that, just hover your cursor over PPO Super Admin at the upper right corner of your screen and select Start Private Chat. Now I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Stephen Wolfolk is the Director of Programming and Marketing at the Kansas City Public Library, where he has arranged and coordinated appearances by Supreme Court Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Stephen Breyer, journalist Dan Rather, and former U.S. Secretary of Labor Robert Reich. Before joining the library, he spent 15 years in the newspaper industry running papers in Missouri and Louisiana. And with that, I will turn the microphone over to Steve. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, before we get started, um, I just want to tell you uh, how much it has meant to me the uh, outpouring of support that I've gotten both from the Kansas City Public Library and from the uh, uh, larger library community around the world, really. Um, and some of you here might have been the people that sent uh, words of encouragement my way. Um, and if you did, thank you very much, um, or, or you know, even just th thank you for uh, for your support in any way that you have uh, offered it. Um, so it occurs to me that uh, there might be a few people here that aren't aware of what happened. So I thought I'd begin here with a, a brief overview, um, and then we'll, we'll go a little more step by step, and I'll, I'll try to walk you through from the beginning what happened and how it happened and, and what lessons maybe we can all learn from that. Um, so back in May, uh, the library partnered with uh, the Truman Library Institute and the Jewish Community Foundation uh, to host Ambassador Dennis Ross. Um, during the Q&A at that program, a library patron uh, was physically removed um, by a combination of uh, one of those partners and uh, the off-duty police officers that were there um, for essentially asking an unpopular question. Uh, you know, the, the, the argument that they're going to make is, is that he was disruptive and that's what warranted it. Um, but I think that, that most people that were there agreed that in, in the end of the day, uh, it was the content of the question that led to his removal. Um, I attempted to uh, intervene um, on his behalf um, and was myself arrested. Um, during that arrest, I did suffer some injuries. Uh, I had a, a minor tear, tear of the MCL. Um, some, some pretty significant bruising and some uh, ligament damage to my right elbow. Um, with that said, uh, you know, those are all uh, real and lingering um, injuries. But many of you, your, your first exposure to this story might have been the uh, one that was done by the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. Uh, and the headline for that one was something to the effect of librarian brutally arrested. 
Um, you know, I'm not sure that I like that term. Uh, you know, there, there are people that are brutally arrested every day, um, and I'm not sure that what happened to me quite meets that standard. Um, but certainly it was inappropriate. Uh, I have no question about that. Um, so now what we're going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you all a, uh, a quick video um, of the actual arrest. So um, think of this kind of like one of those TV shows where they start at the end and then we're going to rewind um, and tell you what happened from the beginning. So this is actual uh, the actual arrest of uh, me at the event. Um, so as you can see here, the, uh, the, the first police officer that ri arrives is out of uniform. And uh, one of the issues here from my perspective is that nobody identified themselves um, or mentioned the, the word arrest at any point. Um, so, you know, I was just kind of grabbed from behind here and shoved into this pillar without knowing what was happening. Um, and, and, you know, in the moment, it seems like this stuff goes on for several minutes. And then every time I watch this video and I realize that it was actually closer to 20 seconds, um, it, it kind of surprises me. Um, so let's go back to the slides now, if we can. So I thought it was it was kind of important to lend some context here to just kind of tell you uh, what the, the Kansas City Public Library programming model is. When I started here about 11 years ago now, uh, we had a grant uh, to do programming. The stated uh, goal of that grant was to get people to come to the uh, downtown branch that was in a part of town that uh, people were kind of weary of after dark. Um, so we debated some, some different ways that we could do that. And you know, the traditional model, of course, is that you, you go through speakers bureaus and you uh, end up paying some pretty ridiculous sums of money to get people to come out. And uh, we decided to go a slightly different direction. Um, and really, I think what we did is we made our programming in a lot of ways mirror our book collection. Um, so instead of focusing on getting big names to come in that we thought that we could draw a crowd for, Instead, we concentrated on bringing in people that presented some educational or cultural value in their content. Um, we wanted diverse content. Um, so, and that, and that means to us not just bringing in people that are writing on subjects that appeal to different cultures, uh, but political leanings as well. Um, we have a series uh, that we do that we alternate between uh, the National Review and, uh, and the Nation um, who bring people in. Um, so, you know, we try to represent the, the left and the right and, uh, and treat everybody uh, fairly politically, culturally, um, in every way that we possibly can. And then we try to figure out what people wanted um, and, and do more of that. Um, and it's worked. So uh, this is a, a photo from not the event in question. This is actually a gentleman named Peter Charles Hoffer. Um, he wrote a book about uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, and, you know, most people have probably never heard of this gentleman. Um, but we had nearly 500 people um, at the library for, for his talk because we knew that the, uh, the topic would, uh, would draw people and we knew that we had established a reputation for doing programs that were uh, presenting accurate, reliable information. And uh, one of the things that that's done is because we've had success in bringing people in and, uh, and built this marketing machine um, that includes 40,000 people now that have signed up to get information about the events that are happening at the library uh, were approached often by outside groups who want to work with us um, because we have the space, because we have the, uh, the marketing uh, muscle and, uh, and the reputation of being able to bring people in. So back in December of 2015, we were approached by the uh, Truman Library Institute about hosting Ambassador Dennis Ross for a discussion about uh, Harry S. Truman and Israel. And uh, it's important to note that we partner with the Truman Library Institute on a number of successful issues or, or series. Um, I would argue that they are probably the, the best partner that we have had over the years. Uh, you know, we do a series with them called Hell to the Chiefs that focuses on the American president. Uh, we do Beyond the Gowns, uh, which is a, a First Lady-centered program. And then we do uh, one called Legal Landmarks uh, that, that was part of what Peter Charles Hoffer was uh, a part of that uh, kind of breaks down important uh, legal precedents um, and explains the law behind them. So the only difference in this case was that we, we kind of we introduced the third partner in the, in the Jewish Community Foundation. Um, but, you know, the Truman Library Institute was taking the lead. Uh, we'd worked with them in the past. We know how they work. They know how we work um, and, and had every expectation that uh, everything would go fine.
it didn't. Um, so when they first asked us about having off-duty police at the library, uh, I was a little weary. Um, and you know, here are here are my reasons why. Um, you know, first of all, the mere presence of an armed agent of the state, I think, in a lot of ways, discourages discourse. Um, and to use an extreme example of that, imagine if you will, um, you're doing a program about uh, police abuse of power, um, and if the mayor and and maybe a lawyer and the city attorney are sitting up there on the stage as part of this panel discussion. The tenor of the questions and the questions that people are willing to ask, um, which may be important questions, changes, I think, if there is an armed policeman uh, standing next to them. Um, the other reason is all, all that they can do is, is make arrests, at least in Kansas City. Um, you know, police are not there to serve as bodyguards. Um, they are not there to enforce the rules of your building. Um, they are there to to be an armed presence and to be able to make an arrest if a law is broken. And typically, what's going to happen is if, if there is somebody who you want to leave um, and you ask them to leave and they refuse to do so, um, then yes, there's, there's probably value in, in having the, the police there because then you can explain to the police officer that you've asked this person to leave. They haven't. At that point, they're trespassing. A law has been broken, and, uh, and they can take over. Um, and then finally, in my experience, uh, there, there's really no reason for it. And that's that's really exclusive to us. I know that everybody has uh, their own things that are that are going on. Um, there was a webinar a while back about uh, um, the, the Muslim Journeys uh, series that a lot of people did. Um, and, and that, of course, was a, a, a valid reason to maybe want to have off-duty police at the library if there are threats being made against uh, your staff and your facility. Um, but from our standpoint, we've never had a problem uh, with anybody at any of our events. Um, I've had to remove, in my 11 years, one person um, from a library event. And that was somebody who fell asleep, and they were snoring and disrupting the program. And, and we had to wake him up and ask him to leave. Uh, so without a, uh, anybody with a gun being there to, uh, to help him out. Um, so here's why we relented. Um, many of you may have heard about this. Um, a gentleman drove up from, uh, from Springfield. Um, a little over uh, a year ago, or I guess almost two years ago now, and opened fire at the uh, Jewish Community Center on the uh, Kansas side of uh, the state line. And uh, three people were killed. And certainly we understood that, uh, that there, were some, so there was some animosity there um, and, some, and, and there was some concern on the part of uh, the, the partners um, that this sort of thing could happen again. Um, so we did. We relented. Um, and we allowed them to bring in the off-duty police for this program. Um, we did, however, place uh, two conditions on on that. Um, the first question was that nobody would be removed for asking an unpopular question. Um, and if I'm being honest with you, the question that was asked was not the one I was worried about. Um, you know, my biggest fear when we went into this was was that we were going to have a Holocaust denier in the audience. Um, and, and I was concerned about how that was going to uh, go down if, uh, if that question was, if that issue was brought up. Um, number two was that nobody would be removed, removed period, at all um, without first consulting with the library unless there was a, a clear and imminent threat. Um, so if there's a weapon involved, if somebody rushes the speaker, if somebody rushes somebody in the audience, then um, yes, in that case, absolutely. We didn't think that was going to happen. That didn't happen. Um, but then in, in the event that it did, uh, you know, we told everybody, please feel free to take care of that. Um, but if it's somebody that you decide is being disruptive um, for whatever reason, uh, consult with us before you have somebody physically removed from the public library. So here we have, I'm going to share with you two questions just to uh, kind of illustrate the fact that we're not strangers to having unusual questions, uh, offensive questions asked at the library. Um, so many of you, I'm sure you can all see this, but I'm going to read it anyway. This was Matthew Desmond, who wrote uh, the book Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. First question out of the gate. Um, rights require responsibility. If you aren't responsible, you don't deserve them. Why should the rest of the people who are responsible have to make up for these irresponsible people? Give them a choice. If they want to be helped out, then they have to undergo sterilization. Ask this question. Audible gasp from the audience. People were clearly taken aback. Um, he finished. He sat down. 
Um, I directed our staff to kind of keep an eye on uh, on him after the event just to make sure that he didn't get into a confrontation. Uh, but the program ended. He left. Everybody else left. Uh, you know, there, were, there was no problem. Um, and then on the lighter side, this was 2012. We hosted a series of watch parties for the presidential debates. Um, and we invited, we had a panel afterwards to answer questions from the audience. And we had one lady at that program ask, what about the aliens? And how come nobody's talking about the aliens? We don't know what they're doing. Somebody knows. And they aren't telling us about the aliens and their plans for dealing with the aliens. So it's not unusual for us to get um, odd and sometimes troubling and offensive questions. Um, back here. Uh, and just so you know, you know, typically what we do is, you know, we're always have somebody positioned near the microphones during during the Q and A. And if somebody does step over that line, and more often than not, the way that they step over that line is maybe they go on a little bit too long um, at the microphone. And we'll just have somebody, either myself or somebody else on the public affairs staff, uh, step in, tap them on the shoulder, um, tell them, let's finish up this point, and then we've got a lot of people waiting in line. And that has never once failed to work for us. So I, I found this kind of interesting. This is how Dennis Ross uh, finished up his talk. Um, and you, know, you can read this on your own, read it later. Uh, the one part of this I want to share with you is the very end. Um, you have one state in this region that has freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, where everything is debated. And uh, that struck me since that night as kind of ironic that this is how he finished his talk. Um, and then within five minutes of this, somebody is being hauled out of a public library by armed police for uh, exercising those very freedoms. Um, so this is the question. Um, and uh, I've, I've included this here because uh, I just want to be, you know, I'm not going to read all of this. Um, I'll let you look at it and you can go back and read it all later if you don't have time to do with it now. But I thought it was important that the entire context of the question uh, be up here in an unedited fashion because, I, I, you know, I don't want anybody um, questioning our motives um, for doing any of this. So um, full disclosure, this is, this is the entire transcript of the question that the patron asked. Um, and I've highlighted here, and, and I'll read this part, because this is the part I think that uh, that, that was troubling to people and, and first got uh, the authorities involved. Um, so you see this long history of not only the United States, but Israel utilizing terrorism that includes potentially the death of its own tribe to advance its own geopolitical cause all the way up into the 21st century including September 11th and that whole mess, that I would tell people to look at Alan Sabrowski, the Jewish courageous Marine who uh, has exposed the Zionist. Um, and then there's, there's something there that's uh, inaudible. I think he said movement, um, but I, I can't be certain. Um, so really, it was the mention of this uh, Alan Sabrowski. When that name came up was when there was uh, some rumbling in the audience, some people booing at the mention of that name. And that's when you, you also would see the uh, security guards, not the off-duty police, but the private security team for the, uh, the Jewish Community Foundation um, approached the microphones at that point to, to keep an eye on this guy. Um, so this is a shot of the actual event as he's finishing up. That's Dennis Ross on the stage. Um, and I'll have another picture that better illustrates this. But uh, you'll see in the foreground of this photo, there's an aisle. There's a matching aisle on the other side. Um, that's where the microphones are placed um, in this particular facility when we begin the Q&A. So here's a better shot down that aisle. So right down there at the end is where the microphone would have been, where the uh, patron was asking this question. So the speaker actually handled it really well. Um, and there was a, uh, a brief and, and quite polite exchange between Ross and the patron. Um, the patron had asked a follow-up question. Um, Ross was answering it. As he was answering it, the patron was starting to back away. Um, when Ross finished, uh, the patron leaned back into the microphone. Um, he claims that he was just going to say thank you. Um, there's no way to know that uh, because at that point that he leaned back in, um, he was uh, uh, grabbed a hold of by one of the private security members um, and started to be, to be pushed away from the uh, microphone as he leaned back in. So uh, what did I do? Um, so I guess I, I've kind of overlooked a, a small issue here. Um, 
So when the security guard first approached the patron and grabbed a hold of him, the patron actually responded in a in a calm uh, manner. There's actually some videos of this that you uh, you have to listen really hard to even hear this because he was he was uh, very much uh, polite and under control at this point. Uh, the security guard grabbed him and and he said, uh, um, "Please don't touch me." Um, and then another security guard approached from the side and he grabbed him and they both started pulling him off. At that time, the patron became a little louder and. Uh, shouting, um, really, there's no way to put it, um, take your hands off of me. Um, so at that point, I start to approach uh, the off-duty police officer who was there also is approaching at the same time. Uh, we were both standing in the same general vicinity. Um, I'll show you where that was in just a moment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm down there, you know, primarily trying to de-escalate this situation. Uh, because here you have a, a spot where, you know, my primary concern is that they violated this agreement that we've had, um, but you know, this very close second is the fact that we have a patron here who they're trying to remove um, from the library um, who hadn't done anything to warrant uh, his removal. Um, so I approach and uh, I make an effort to place myself between the patron and the security guard. Um, I'm very careful to uh, to take a de-escalating um, posture and all this. Uh, I've got my hands open, my hands are out to the side, uh, trying to keep my, uh, my voice down, um, or at least calm, and just position myself between them. And I just keep saying, you know, look, we had an agreement as to how we were going to deal with these things. Um, this isn't how we were going to do it. This isn't how we do things at the public library. Um, he's saying, if you will ask him to leave, he will do so. Um, so can we all just take a step back and try that? Um, and eventually they do. Uh, the, the police release him. Um, they say, okay, it's time to go, and, uh, and we all walk out. Um, and at this point, I, I tell them, you know, there's a back entrance here that kind of goes through the, the bowels of the building. Let's take that. I don't want them to go marching through the auditorium and further disrupt this, uh, this program. Um, so I'm leading them out the back. Um, this is the picture I was telling you about. So this is also a different, a different uh, um, event, but this is a, a book signing. Um, and you can see off the stage here, that's actually me in the blue shirt, wearing the exact same shirt I was wearing that night. Who would have thought? Um, so here's where, where we usually have a library person standing at these events to uh, police the, the Q&A. And then you can see in the back, there's, uh, there's a door there, and that's the door that goes back to the bowels of the building. So that's where I lead uh, Jeremy. Uh, security guards and the police officer back through that space. So at that point, um, everything seems to be under control. Um, I feel as though I've done my job. I've, I've de-escalated the situation. Um, they've uh, they've asked the patron to leave. He's agreed to to do so. Um, everybody seems to be happy. Um, we left to go back and. Uh, I, I go to uh, find my direct supervisor who was there that night. I would have been the second ranking library person in the facility. Um, and I went to find my supervisor, uh, primarily because you know we have worked with off-duty police before. Um, we knew that the, the only thing that they could really make an arrest for was trespassing. And so I wanted to immediately make clear to everybody involved that uh, this was the library. We are the library. Uh, and we didn't want this individual to be charged with trespassing. Um, so as you saw in the video, as I as I round the corner, um, you know, here's the the pillar that you saw in the video. Uh, my supervisor is actually sitting in a chair that's just out of this frame um, on the other side of the elevator there. Um, so we come in, and I round that pillar to go find her, and that's when I, I feel myself um, shoved into uh, the pillar. Um, and I remember turning around almost immediately to. Uh, because nobody had identified themselves, and I wasn't sure what was happening. So my first instinct is to turn around. Um, and it's not somebody, it's not one of the uniformed off-duty police officers that was, that was there. Um, it turns out it was, uh, it was the off-duty um, police officer who was out of uniform that day, um, but hadn't identified himself, hadn't used the word arrest. I didn't know what was happening. Um, and I just I remember, as they were saying, stop resisting, stop resisting, you know, I just kept asking, what am I resisting? Um, I, Everybody's told me what's going on here. I'd be happy to do whatever it is you want me to do, but I need to know what that is. Um, and you know, I, I never realized this before. 
um, probably should have, but until you're in the moment, you don't. It can become really hard to uh, figure out exactly what you're supposed to be doing when nobody is giving you verbal instructions, um, when you're put in a situation where you don't expect this sort of thing to be happening to begin with, um, and then you have two different people, um, and, and in parts of the video three, because you see the gentleman with the white hair was the uh, private security person for the JCF, and he was involved at one point. And when they're all kind of pulling and pushing you in different directions, it, it becomes, it's very disorienting, and it's hard to um, figure out exactly what it is that they want you to do in that situation. Um, eventually, you know, I, I remember thinking to myself, okay, here's the chair, and that's the chair actually that my supervisor was sitting in now that I think about it. Um, eventually, I remember seeing that, and I think, okay, um, if I just get over here, I don't want to fall on my face. Um, there's a chair. I'll just walk over there. I'll sit down, and maybe then they'll realize that, that, I'm, that I'm not a threat here, that you know, try to explain to them that I'm in the library. Um, so that was a mistake. As we got there, they kind of used the chair as leverage to, uh, to trip me up and, and eating the ground anyway. Um, but uh, that was kind of what was going on in my mind at the time. Um, so here's kind of kind of my final thoughts on this, um, and I won't spend a lot of time here, but uh, just some things that, that I've thought about in the wake of this and that I hope that uh, um, you'll think about as well. You know, the first thing is I, th I think that libraries are and should be places of discovery and discourse. And this goes back to what I said at the outset um, when I mentioned that I think our programming tries to mirror the collection in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that... Uh, you know, a good library collection is like a liberal arts education. And, you know, we want our, you know, if, if the collection is the textbooks in a liberal arts education, we want our programming to be the lectures in a liberal arts education. Um, so, and I, and I think that that's really important. And in order for to be able to do that successfully, um, the same protections have to apply to that discourse as applies to uh, the, the books that we're featuring on our shelves. Um, you know, the, the second question is, should libraries be safe spaces? And this is this is complicated for me because I'm still not entirely, everybody seems to have a different definition of exactly what constitutes a safe space in 2016. Um, I would just say that, yes, uh, libraries should be safe spaces in the sense that you are safe from harm, safe from, from violence, um, and perhaps even safe from uh, violent or sexist or racist or bigoted rhetoric. Uh, but libraries should not be safe spaces in the sense that you can be safe from ideas uh, that you disagree with. Um, you know, I think that we need to be willing to hear other viewpoints. Um, we need to be able to disagree. We need to come to accept the fact that just because you disagree with an opinion, that is not harming you. Um, and, and I think that when we lose that distinction, uh, it, becomes, it becomes really difficult to promote civil discourse um, if, if somebody is making the case that they feel unsafe because they're confronted with an idea that they don't agree with. Um, third, do we have an obligation to protect the free speech of our patrons? I go back to number one. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that we do, um, especially in a situation like this where you have an, an open dialogue um, with, a, with a speaker that's presenting on a subject uh, who is answering questions on that topic. Um, not allow anybody to come in and tell us what books um, we can have on the shelf because they disagreed with the content. Um, not, or at least the vast majority of us would not uh, allow anyone to come in and uh, and get the the records of, of uh, checkouts um, for a patron um, because they disagreed with something that they were perhaps reading. Uh, I think absolutely that same protection should extend to people that are asking questions inside of the library. Um, at programs or otherwise. Um, and lastly, would I do it again? Um, I think so. Um, you know, I might do things a, a little bit uh, differently up front, um, but if I was confronted with this, uh, this situation again, the ultimate situation of uh, someone who was not a member of the library staff trying to silence a library patron, uh, I believe that I would. I hope that I would. So that's pretty much all I've got, um, and I will look forward to uh, hearing any questions that you have at the end, and uh, I'll try to answer them as honestly and as thoroughly as I can. 
Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I have seen a couple of questions come through for uh, Steve, but we will come back to those at the Q&A at the end. Um, right now, I would like to introduce Deborah Caldwell-Stone, Deputy Director of the ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. An attorney by training, Deborah now works closely with librarians, teachers, and library trustees on a wide range of intellectual freedom issues, including book challenges, internet filtering, meeting room policies, and the impact of new technologies on library users' privacy. Before she joined ALA in the year 2000, Caldwell Stone practiced appellate law before state and federal courts in Chicago. And I will pass the mic to Deborah. Thank you, Sarah. So the truth is that uh, we were talking about library programs and the law, but the fact is, is that the application of the First Amendment to library programming specifically has really not been considered by courts or legislatures. In fact, libraries are more frequently defendants in lawsuits challenging the removal or relocation of books or the filtering of the internet or library policies that regulate users' behavior and access to the library. These are, in fact, the cases that have defined how the First Amendment applies to library as a whole. And I'd like to take some time to provide context myself and review what the courts have said about libraries and free expression. In modern legal analysis, courts have classified both physical and virtual spaces for free speech activities into different types of forums to determine the level of First Amendment protection for free speech in those spaces. And what we are most familiar with are what they call traditional public forums, um, idealized as public parks or sidewalks, where the First Amendment freedoms are most protected by the government. And then we have what's called designated or limited public forums, which are places and institutions opened up by the government uh, for particular free speech activities by part or all of the public. Um, and this is where the library falls. It's a quintessential designated public forum because it's been opened up by the government for one particular speech activity uh, for access for information, for the receipt of information, so, uh, encompassing such activities like reading, studying, and using the library's resources and materials. Um, but it's not open for other speech activities, such as making speeches, distributing pamphlets, um, um, collecting uh, petition signatures, uh, protesting, for example. So when we think about the exercise of First Amendment rights in the library, uh, at least as the law has conceived of it, we shouldn't think of a person giving a speech or passing out uh, those pamphlets, uh, but as a person entitled under the First Amendment to receive information. And by and law, large, that's the issue the courts have addressed, whether the library user's First Amendment right to receive information has been violated in some way, either by the library itself or some other arm of the government. So, but in fact, the library can enhance free speech in the library by opening up space and services in the library for other free speech activities, um, such as meetings um, and program spaces. And in fact, we have a well-developed body of law in regards to meeting rooms and program spaces. And in fact, this is one of the places where the libraries have been most challenged uh, uh, in the courts, uh, both on free exercise and on establishment of religion grounds, as well as infringement of association rights uh, for restrictive policies regarding meeting rooms that limited the right of religious groups to use those meeting rooms. So we do have this robust body of law um, that have outlined the, the legal responsibilities in regards to these programming spaces. And the first thing to remember is because if you, you know, going back to that limited, limited designated public forum, you know, the library's mission is to provide access for information. That's why the government has opened it. So the library is not obligated to open up these programming spaces for the public's use. But if it does open up these spaces, the First Amendment applies in full to these meeting rooms and programming spaces. Um, um, as, when, uh, and, uh, and as a result, um, the library has to be particularly careful um, 
about the rights of those people who are using them. For example, um, the library can't deny access to those meeting rooms because the group has controversial beliefs. And we can think about this in the context of the controversy when Matthew Hale of the uh, white nationalist uh, world church was going around the country using libraries as a platform for his speeches. Um, he was, uh, a number of libraries tried to deny him access and were sued by Matt Hale uh, successfully, in fact, and, um, and ended up having actually paying legal fees to Matt Hale for denying them, uh, at denying him access to their meeting space. Um, you can't deny um, uh, access to the meeting rooms if they belong to a particular group, for example, a particular religious group, or that they're religious at all. Um, you, if, the fact is, is if the person requesting to use the meeting room meets the criteria established by the library, that is, they hold a library card, or they live in the community served by the library, or they're a nonprofit identified in library policy as a group eligible to use the meeting room, you have to provide them access to the meeting room um, without regard to the fact that they might be controversial or they belong to a church um, or other group that, has, uh, that may raise questions about their access to the library. But alternatively, the library can establish rules governing the time, place, and manner of use um, they, uh, of, that as long as those rules don't deal with the content of the speech, the subject matter of the meeting, um, they have to be very practical rules, things like time limits on use, limits on how many people use the room, limits on the use of amplification and sound systems. Um, they can do things like require that the meeting be open to the public or that the group clean up after itself. As long as they don't um, limit access to the room or govern the content of the meeting or the speech in the room on the basis of the viewpoint or the beliefs of the group or the individual using the room, the law, those kinds of rules are fine. Uh, and finally, the rules have to be applied uh, without discrimination. If you have a rule about uh, not using sound systems, uh, you can't give permission to the Girl Scouts to use a sound system because you like them uh, uh, and then deny it to everyone else. You just have to be very neutral and non-discriminatory in your application of these rules. Now, the thing to remember about library programming is that, in fact, publicly funded libraries have discretion in regards to their programs, much as they have discretion over the development of their collections. Um, the law understands that libraries must, by necessity, make choices about materials and programming. You can't buy every book. You can't host every speaker. You can't put a Hyde Park corner in the middle of your library. Um, and so the law has recognized that libraries have to make these choices, and they look to the profession's traditional commitment to providing access to a broad range of viewpoints and ideas without discrimination uh, as a basis for trusting the libraries to make these kinds of decisions. Um, but you have to, but this means that there is a difference between the library as a program sponsor and uh, the library as a provider of public programming space. As a program sponsor, the library can choose speakers and facilitate uh, the program and the conversation. Um, they can establish ground rules. Um, they make decisions about what happens in the programming space um, and uh, can ask people to observe some common ground rules about the discussion. However, hearkening back to what we just talked about, as a provider of public meeting space, uh, the library simply can't engage in censorship or control of the speaker, the content of their speech, or control the conduct of the meeting. Uh, so two different roles there for the library in regards to, pro, uh, you know, uh, as a program sponsor and as a provider of programming space. And just as the courts haven't addressed First Amendment application to library programming, they haven't addressed the role or the duties of public libraries or their employees in regards to defending the First Amendment rights of public library users. Um, 
and it is a fact that courts have allowed libraries and librarians to challenge legislation in the courts on behalf of library users. Um, probably the most um, uh, uh, well known of these kinds of cases uh, is the lawsuit challenging internet filtering uh, or the lawsuits that were challenging the Patriot Act uh, a few years ago. Um, but the law has been silent on the librarian's role in defending users' rights within the library. Um, and if I had to make an educated guess, it's they would see the library librarian as an employee of this government agency uh, as someone charged with facilitating access to information in accordance with the library's mission, but without any particular duty to defend the rights of uh, the library user. So given that there is no recognized role as a defender of rights under the law, librarians have to call upon their professional ethics and standards of practice. Um, documents like the Code of Ethics and the Library Bill of Rights as their basis for defending patrons' First Amendment rights in the library. And in fact, much of the defense of free speech in the library is founded on librarians' ethical commitment to intellectual freedom rather than the law, simply because the law has not carved out this role. Now, this means you should turn to your policy. Um, I say policy, policy, policy in the same way that someone who deals with real estate says location, location, location. Policy is the best tool you have for advancing intellectual freedom, professional ethics in the library's mission, and protecting the rights of your library users. So you should be developing written and published policies to address uh, the use of your meeting rooms, uh, user behavior, and how you conduct library-sponsored programming uh, in order to facilitate these values. Um, some basic rule of thumb, as I said, the library policy should be writing in writing, excuse me, <clears throat> um, they should be applied objectively, they have to be enforced consistently. Um, and finally, the policies have to be reasonable and related to library use. Um, but within those parameters, you can do a great deal um, to advance the library's mission. Uh, for example, you can have a specific policy that advances the mission of promoting civic engagement and deliberative dialogue in the library, or um, to promote the use of the library as a place for uh, programming, uh, public programming, and civil discourse. Um, one tip, always consult your library's attorney uh, when developing these kinds of policies uh, and developing procedures for policy enforcement. Um, you want to make sure that there is no uh, uh, hidden uh, tripping points within your policy that might cause problems for the library down the road. Um, such as the early, uh, provisions that uh, excluded religious groups from libraries' meeting rooms that caused so many problems for so many libraries in the past. In fact, there are many tools for dealing with controversy, and I will want to give full credit to Leslie Williams of the Evanston Public Library here for developing um, a, a number of tips on dealing with controversial programs in programming in the library so that everyone has a great experience. It is a great opportunity for um, uh, uh, dialogue and learning about new ideas um, and that um, everyone's rights are respected in uh, uh, both the speaker, the attendees, um, uh, so that um, everyone has a great experience. Um, she has advised that you prepare yourself in your institution when you're considering taking on a program that may pose um, uh, a potential controversy, uh, controversy for the library. Uh, she suggests that you research and know about the topic of the meeting, uh, that you research and know all about your pro library's policies and any possible legal issues that may arise. Um, in particular, she has pointed out things like there will be people who, when you have controversial programming, may object to you offering the program, um, saying that you have to provide 
balance or uh, place a particular speaker in opposition to the speaker you engaged, well, in fact, that's false. Um, as I described before, libraries have discretion in their programming, and you know it, the the court will look at what the library has done over a broad period of time rather than what it's done with a particular program. The library has a right to produce the programs it wants to produce. Um, and she suggests working closely with administration and make sure that the administration of the library understands how the topic and the program relates to the library's mission. Uh, she offers some tips on dealing with the media. Um, for example, having an elevator speech to describe the program uh, and a handout for the press and attendees that disp explains the background of the program so that there's very real clarity on, on what the library's try, uh, uh, goal is in presenting the program. Um, working to understand what gotcha questions are um, and have a good answer for gotcha questions. Most often these come down to questions about why the library is dealing in controversy. And it's easy to develop a, a quick speech that emphasizes that it's the library's role to offer the public information from a variety of viewpoints and provide good opportunities to learn about all kinds of different kinds of issues within a, a public discussion space. Uh, she also recommends working with speakers to make sure that they are the kind of people who can communicate about the topic knowledgeably, um, to understand where the speaker might go with the topic uh, when they do present their program. And then she suggests introducing the speaker to the audience in a way that emphasizes their background, their experience. Um, their accomplishments so as to humanize them. So if there is hostility in the room, that you diffuse it. Um, being a proactive facilitator is always important to promoting civic discourse uh, in, in the library, um, uh, which is a particular role the library can take on as a program sponsor that they might not be able to take on for simply providing programming space as a meeting room. Uh, you can develop ground rules and agreements to make sure that the conversation doesn't get out of hand and that allow people to have their say. Rules like not interrupting people, no shouting out, um, uh, getting and then getting everyone to agree to support these kinds of ground rules. Um, as a facilitator, you can ensure that people don't monopolize the microphone, that they actually ask questions. Um, there are some tactics that you can use to do this. I refer you to Leslie's great um, video and slides for more specific tips in this area. And finally, she has talked about establishing a safe place for dialogue. Now, um, she and when she talks about a safe place for dialogue, she is talking about and wants to support the idea of the library as a place where everyone can come and feel that they can have their say without being threatened, uh, without being intimidated into silence. Um, and uh, this means um, uh, uh, going back again to the ground rules, um, stating expectations for audience behavior and even speaker behavior um, and getting everyone to agree to those expectations. Um, uh, doing small things uh, as simple as going out into the audience before the program starts and shaking hands and introducing yourself and getting to know everyone. So again, you have this process of uh, humanizing everyone so that there's less um, uh, less uh, opportunity to identify another member of the audience, the library, the speaker as the other, um, and diffusing um, some of the hostility in that, that uh, situation. Now, uh, again, Steve talked about this a bit, but she also recommends, for particularly controversial programs, hiring off-duty police as security. Um, and she actually believes that it might be helpful to have them in uniform so that people see that there is security and law enforcement there in case that there is a member of the audience there who intends to be disruptive and you want to, uh, and it helps to uh, get them to agree to the ground rules and, and, be, and uh, accept the, the terms of, of the conversation rather than be, becoming dis uh, uh, shouting out or interrupting the speaker or 
uh, engaging in other disruption. Um, and she also points out that some speakers actually insist on security. Um, uh, and this is the bodyguard question that Steve raised, is that there are some, from time to time, there are speakers who um, have concerns about stalkers or are particularly controversial. And they would feel safer themselves as a speaker to have uh, off-duty police in, uh, present in the auditorium. Um, to put Kansas City in perspective in light of all of the foregoing, I have to say that it's truly a unique situation. Um, the library appears to have done everything right. They, you know, Steve prepared well. Um, they had ground rules established. They had written uh, agreements. Um, and yet, it was all derailed by the fact that there were a number of off-duty police officers not in the control of the library present who acted on their own to address the situation that the officers viewed as a disruption. Um, and the, the problem is, of course, is that police officers are authorized to act. And um, they're authorized to use their police powers. And there's very little recourse left to the library if an officer begins to exercise those police powers, even in the middle of a meeting. Um, uh, in those situations, the library can't do much more uh, than to address the, the officer's behavior in later court proceedings, whether it's defending against the charges filed by the officers in court or by filing later lawsuits alleging either civil liberties violations or unlawful arrest um, uh, and seeking vindication from the courts down the road. Uh, of course, you can always go back to the program partners. Um, if uh, regarding the written agreements and ask for their assistance and dealing with the situation. Um, there are things to think about in, in, uh, in regards to Steve's experience that we can look forward uh, in a looking forward fashion. Uh, you know, he used a written agreement, but really use a written agreement. Um, you almost make a, you could even raise it to the level of a contract if uh, you can develop such a document with your library's attorney. Um, it's actually a good thing to have because if this does go, if a situation does end up before the courts, you have a memorial of what was agreed to by the parties um, uh, and evidence of everyone's intent going into the program. Um, of course, all the partners for the program should sign off on this agreement uh, in light of the desire to bind everyone to its terms. Um, an important thing, I think, is whenever you do have written agreements, it's always valuable to have in-person meetings to review those agreements among the parties and, and you know, do a verbal checkoff and, and get assent from everyone to each of the terms. Uh, much as if you have ground rules for your audience, you describe the ground rules and get everyone's assent during, at the beginning of the program. Um, so that there are no misunderstandings and you can discover if there is going to be a problem before the program takes place. And here's an important thing, and I think Steve would agree with me. I think you have to insist that any security personnel that are there are hired and directed by the library. Um, when Leslie Williams recommends the presence of an off-duty police officer, well, in fact, that officer is hired by the library and paid by the library and works at Leslie's direction when she invites the officer in to be present for a program. And I think that this is the important thing. The officers should look to the library for their direction, not to uh, another program partner um, uh, at all, um, so that you maintain full control of what's going on in the audience. And it's in this way that you can ensure that um, everyone feel ha you know, that you're creating a safe space for dialogue in the library. Um, that you can ensure that no one needs to feel uh, threatened unless they're actually disruptive and breaking the rules the library itself has set. Um, and, um, and you can uh, do uh, probably the best way to avoid the situation of uh, an officer acting on their own because they're, in fact, your employee. And then finally, the, as I discussed a little earlier, there are some legal limits on responding to the actions of law enforcement officers. Um, 
you know, uh, you there's just just so much you can do, and some uh, you know sometimes the best thing is to step aside and comment from the side, um, uh, because officers as uh, may you know may perceive what you're saying or doing as a threat, and they'll act on that. And uh, so you want to try to avoid that confrontation. Um, and understand that if things do happen within the program, you may end up turning to the courts, as Steve and his library have uh, now in this situation. So uh, in sum, you know, I, I think libraries are great. You know, it's a great thing for libraries to be engaged in this work. And it's important work. Um, and the work to uh, promote civic dialogue, to promote uh, the, uh, the access to ideas. And um, with just some uh, few uh, ground rules, um, some use of some of these tools like written agreements, I, I think it's uh, something that all libraries can accomplish well. Uh, so with that, I'll turn this back to Sarah for questions. Um, uh, and, and uh, discussion. Thank you, Deborah. We have a just a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm also putting on the screen some resources that Deborah has put together, so please help yourself to those. Um, the first question is sort of a, a three-parter for Steve, and it, it has to do with what is happening now. Um, Nina asked, "How is the library handling the arrest, handling the arrest and upcoming trial?" And what have the partners had to say in the wake of these events? And I'd like to tack on, are you going to work with them again? Um, yeah. Um, so I'm glad you asked that question. Um, so let me just say the library has been great, um, and not just the administration. Uh, my immediate supervisor uh, took my cell phone. She talked to my wife that night to make sure she knew what was going on, uh, met me at the police station, called the director of the library, Crosby Kemper. Um, he came down to the police station. He was calling all of his contacts, lawyers, the uh, police chief, um, everybody that he could think of. Uh, the woman who is a former uh, president of the police board in Kansas City happened to be at the program. She came down um, and, and worked on, on this on our end. Um, so everybody at the library has been great. Um, the administration, and really I also I can't thank uh, our public affairs staff enough because you know I've been gone a lot more than I should be lately. Um, whether it's uh, it's in this little uh, office here doing this, or uh, traveling, or in court, or meeting with my attorney, or whatever, and the uh, public affairs staff here has picked up the uh, burden of the work I haven't been able to get done. Um, so everybody at the library has been great. Um, from a technical standpoint, um, you know they're they're um, mostly leaving this up to me, um, which is uh, in a lot of ways great because it would be easy, I think, for the library any library or any organization really to say, we want to support our employee, we're going to pay your attorney fees, um, but don't let this get crazy. You know, if they offer you a reasonable deal, um, take it because the money's going to run out. Um, and uh, Crosby and the rest of our, our, our uh, executive team um, takes this issue seriously, um, and, and they've made uh, every effort to communicate to me that uh, as long as I want to keep fighting this, that they're going to stand behind me. Um, in terms of, let's see, what was the, the follow-up question that you tacked on? Uh, would you work with this partner again? Um, you know, I think so. I hope so. Um, absolutely, we would work with the uh, Truman Library Institute. We've actually done programs with them before and since this happened. Um, and I would hope that eventually we will work with the uh, the, the JCF again. Um, we haven't done a lot with them directly, but we've done some stuff with some sister organizations that they have in Kansas City, um, and they're uh, they're great partners in terms of bringing in good guests and uh, and helping to get the word out to uh, parts of Kansas City that we would otherwise be able to reach. Um, so you know, from the very beginning, I've, I've I've hoped and I continue to hope that eventually. Everybody is going to wake up one day and, and think to themselves, what have we done? And uh, all of this will go away, and uh, we'll be able to go back to working together to uh, present quality programming uh, and educational opportunities to the people of Kansas City. Great, thank you. We also have a question for Deborah. 
Uh, the question is, in the case of a partner or co-sponsor, as in the Kansas City case, can the library permit censorship just because a partner permits it? And I, I think Nicholas is referring to um, the fact that the, the, the partner was the one who brought in the, the private security and permitted them to make the arrest. Um, that's why I advocate that there be a written agreement and that the library maintain control of security. Um, because, in fact, no, you don't have to allow censorship simply because a partner might prefer it. It should just simply be clear from the outset that if they're going to use the library space, this is, these are the terms that they get to use the library space or partner with the library, that the library does not place restrictions on the audience or its questions, and that it does have, you know, and, you know, that it has its own ground rules that it's willing to enforce when somebody becomes truly disruptive um, uh, of the uh, program. Um, and so uh, the lab, that's why the, the, these written agreements, these, uh, these policies that uh, are so important, so that everyone understands from the outset what the terms are. Here is the rules if you're going to co-sponsor a program with the library. Here's our policy. This is what we expect. And one of the things we expect is that there won't be any untoward censorship of speech um, uh, among the audience members. Um, and so um, this is why it's so important, really, to think about these issues in advance and, and uh, get it down on paper and talk to attorneys, talk uh, to the staff and make sure that uh, there's a complete understanding of where the, what the library's position is, uh, what it's, how it sees its role in, in providing programming, and then making sure that the public and potential partners as well understand where the library is coming from. Um, Can I add one thing so, to that? Sure. Um, I would just say that, that that's uh, the, the one spot where I think we kind of fell down on this. Um, we didn't have an agreement in this case with the police department, um, and largely because that's because it never occurred to us that we would need to. Um, it never occurred to me that uh, the police would, would come into, into our building um, and allow a third party to uh, direct them in what should happen. Um, but apparently that, that can happen. Um, whether or not it should, I don't know, but it can happen. Um, so I would argue in mm -hmm. retrospect. That's a mistake that we made, was not extending the, uh, the written and verbal agreements that we had with everybody else to the actual police department. Yeah, and, and that's why I suggest that kind of, you know, a meeting where all the parties are at the table, including the police, so that there's no misunderstanding uh, and that there's no misunderstanding about who's going to make the decision about when somebody becomes disruptive or whose standard is going to be applied to that. Um, and it's just the just good planning and policy development in advance can help ameliorate all the problems. And then you just have to think about and be prepared for when the worst happens um, and do it and, you know, have a game plan for that as well, but understanding the limits that you have when you're dealing with those kinds of situations. Um, I do see a question about uh, pamphlets. Um, the rules about meeting rooms also apply to literature tables and display cases. You cannot discriminate if you open it up uh, as a public forum. And, and so it's probably safest uh, not to make that distinction between political or, or uh, commercial speech, but simply open up the space um, uh, uh, on a non-discriminatory fashion and then just have time, place, and manner rules so that uh, pamphlets only out for a particular period of time, or you know, or they can only use a certain amount of uh, the same space that everyone else uses. Um, uh, there is a well-developed body of law, and I'd be happy to send anyone our outline on meeting rooms and display cases to address that question. Um, and yes, uh, I would have had the police. If the police were not actually hired by the library, I would have suggested that they sign off on the agreement as well. Thank you very much to um, both of our presenters, Stephen Mulfolk and Deborah Caldwell Stone. Um, sorry, we've run out of time and we haven't gotten to all of your questions, but um, I believe both Steve and Deborah would be okay with you um, if you wanted to contact them directly with any questions that we didn't get to and you will see their contact info on the screen. 
please. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope to see you on a future webinar.